Hello and welcome everyone to this uh, webinar on the future of sourcing and negotiations. My name is Jakob Gorm Larsen. I'm the founder of Moneyball CPH, uh, an advisory within uh, digital uh, procurement. Before that, I spent uh, many years uh, at Maersk, the uh, global container and shipping company, uh, running uh, their digital transformation of uh, procurement. Today, I'll be your moderator. Uh, I'll be also be actively participating uh, in the discussion, so I won't be just facilitator, just as a heads up to everyone. Um, but just to get this started, I'll say digitization is on the top of the priority list for many organizations. But looking at sort of developments over the last couple of years, especially within sourcing and negotiations, it's also very clear that we are just getting started. And when we look at uh, sourcing and negotiations uh, as an area and as a topic, it's especially interesting because technology has been uh, available in this space for more than 25 years. So more than 25 years ago, uh, e-auction saw the light of day with uh, free markets uh, and Glenn Meekham. Uh, and what we'll do today is to have a bit of a look in the crystal ball uh, with the help of some uh, fantastic uh, thought leaders in this space uh, and see what is coming in the future and what is uh, current uh, state of uh, affairs. We have a very diverse panel of speakers with us today, bringing some different uh, perspectives and competences. Uh, so we have a um, Eloise from a, a, a global leading consultancy. We have the analyst angle uh, covered with uh, Corey, and then we have a representative from uh, one of the startups, uh, Fabian from uh, uh, art slit. Uh, we have uh, about 50 minutes uh, for the session here, including a Q&A. So if you have questions, please submit it in the Q&A function, and then we'll try to cover uh, as many as possible. I should also say we have a lot of people on the session today, so we'll most likely not be able to uh, address all questions, but please uh, submit them uh, as we go through. Let's start with a quick uh, introduction uh, of our panel. Just a very short one, a uh, name, role, uh, and a little bit on the background. Uh, let's start with uh, you, Eloise. Hi, hey, I'm Eloise. I'm a partner at Carney, and which is a global management consulting firm known for our work in procurement and supply chain. I am author of the book, Trade Wars, Pandemics, and Chaos. That didn't show up very well. Anyway, there you go. Um, uh, that you get for using a filter. Uh, so anyway, uh, I've been doing this for 22 years. So almost, uh, I remember when Glenn Meekum started free markets. So I, I've been around almost quite that long. So it's lovely to be here. Thank you. Always great to have you. And let's move on to Corey. Yeah, nice meeting everyone. Uh, uh, correct, so my name, I'm Senior Direct Analyst with Gartner. Um, they're in the Supply Chain Research and Advisory Group. Uh, before joining Gartner, I've had about 20 years of experience in practice, uh, in sourcing supply chain and consulting. And uh, also at one point in time, I was a fellow colleague uh, of uh, Dr. Louise Epstein in AP Kearney. So uh, nice meeting you here also again. Great, thanks Corey. Great to have you. And Fabian. Yes, thank you. My name is Fabian. I look after marketing and procurement here at Archlet. Uh, I'm the junior in the round, I would say, uh, because I have only had 11 years in procurement, but uh, also as a category manager and a consultant, mostly focus on e-sourcing, e-auctions, optimization, and topics like that. So therefore, I, uh, I, I'm very much looking forward to this discussion. I think this is great. Cool. Good to have you, Fabian. So in order to, before we move into to really discussing the topic of the day, so the future and, and the look in the crystal ball, let's start by having a look at the, at the history. So, um, and I, um, I want to do that in, uh, in my book, which came out last year, I had a, a full chapter on sort of the history of e-sourcing. So we agreed that I would be suitable to cover uh, that part. I'll do it very quickly. I'll just do sort of 
uh, free milestones on the sort of the history of sourcing and negotiation uh, technology. And we go, uh, we go back to 1995, uh, which was the year where Glenn Meekham, uh, he left uh, GE, founded uh, Free Markets, um, today uh, uh, SAP uh, Ariba, uh, and introduced the first uh, sourcing or e-auction uh, solution, uh, really. Uh, so it, it's been around for many, many years. We then fast forward to uh, the year 2000, where uh, two companies uh, of interest were founded, uh, combined it, uh, the first one out of Pittsburgh, uh, in the US um, and then trade extensions uh, out of Sweden. And the reason why they're interesting is that they were the first uh, solutions that introduced combinatorial optimization uh, within the sourcing technology uh, space. Uh, and then the last uh, milestone, which is another example of the trend uh, which is, is happening uh, these years is uh, late uh, 2018, I still remember it because I was in the conference room in Dublin, uh, Ireland, when uh, Kilva launched the first uh, sourcing bot to sort of fully automate certain parts of the sourcing process. Many others are looking at that now as well, but this first introduction of a market-driven negotiation form, the introduction of combinatorial optimization with uh, combined it and, and, uh, and trade extensions, and then sort of the whole automation piece uh, of sourcing technology, I think are important uh, milestones to consider. Um, as a last, just a quick, and I think it's an interesting anecdote actually, because technology is one piece and, and we'll talk more about that, but really adoption and mindset is the critical parts of this. And when I was, when I was writing my book, I reached out to Glenn Meekham uh, to ask him uh, uh, whether he wanted to write the foreword uh, for my book. And we ended up having a, a number of long discussions. And after reading an early draft, he shared uh, a reflection. And he said, you know, the funny thing is that you have been in this space for many years and, and e-auctions has been around for 25 years, but all the myths and all the challenges in winning over uh, people that is exactly the same challenge as I was facing 25 years ago when I came up with this concept. Uh, so I think it's a good illustration that technology is really one piece. Adoption, change management, winning over people is an essential part of, this, uh, of the problem and also the opportunity that we all need to uh, consider. Um, when we discuss these things. And we'll try to cover that angle as well in the discussions uh, as well today. So we'll fast forward to uh, the present now. And if we look at, uh, at the last uh, two, three years of, uh, of, of procurement technology, uh, there's really been a, a, a huge acceleration of things. And just to make sure that we are all sort of on the same page, um, Corey, could you share sort of your perspective on what is sort of the state of affairs today with procurement technology? So uh, in general, we have uh, covered that space for years, maybe decades uh, to say through uh, some research uh, um, we put out that is mostly known under the title hype cycle. But we also look into specific areas uh, deeper. When we uh, think about the last few years, I totally agree with your comments that there's a lot of movement going on in the entrepreneurial startup space. And there's also some um, ongoing maturity and capabilities of, uh, of um, modules and um, providers that have been around for, for some time and longer um, yeah, involved in, in specific industries. Um, of course, uh, technology is constantly advancing. So does uh, corporations and the organizational structure and the talent need evolve. Um, but when we look for technology, it, it, it scratches uh, now parts where um, we have a couple um, well, con not concerns, but we can see concerns in organizations to adapt to emerging technologies. Some of them overlook them. Some of them consciously avoid them until they are, like we call it in the hype cycle, at the <clears throat> plateau of productivity, right? Um, yeah. And they don't necessarily uh, engage early as an innovation trigger. But we have a couple of very exciting developments on the innovation trigger that can uh, change the way we operate in, in, in the next uh, maybe two to five years. Um, and, and some of them take a bit longer, but I think the most exciting one 
on the hype cycle that is still a bit way out, but we see the first uh, signals to it is sort of going into an autonomous environment. That doesn't mean autonomous without human, but autonomous in a way where things can be machine driven and, and human approved or human evaluated. And then there are other areas where it's human led and uh, technology supported. So autonomous oh. uh, um, a platform to platform is uh, something yeah. we're definitely following and looking into. There are of course some, and you have to call it out, they are in the trough of disillusionment. So technologies that, that have in the market uh, created a big hype and well, a lot of companies were excited about, and then they're not necessarily seeing the ROI or the way they were expecting the implementation to go. And some of that is, <clears throat> and uh, maybe, uh, you know, that will be a, a bit of a shock to some, but uh, RPA in procurement, for example, was really high, right? And then uh, right now we're in the trough of disillusionment and, and um, sometimes I call it a glorified macro, but that's really just my own opinion, not expressing the Gartner opinion. <laughs> uh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> So, uh, we, but there is a lot of potential in RPA. It's just, what are we going to do in use cases to drive ROI out of there, right? And maybe uh, I, I mentioned another one, and that has to do with um, the way we have been looking at procurement generating quote unquote savings and the value equation and the ROI drivers are in many organizations still under savings, whereas the equation is lacking a lot of components, in my opinion, like value uh, drivers, <laughs> such risk management, like sustainable competition, innovation, uh, and, and, and um, strategic roadmap uh, development. So procurement savings management technologies have also not necessarily been yet on the slope of enlightenment. Yep. I would call it. So they're also in the trough of disillusionment a bit, but I, I have hopes that that will come out, but uh, maybe those uh, couple uh, points there and sorry to any folks that are into RPA. Uh, I'm certainly a supporter of RPA. We just have to find the right links, I think, to get into the enlightenment and then the productivity side of now, it. I, I have to be careful with my role as motivator here because I'm, I'm a huge fan of RPA, which I, I'm sure a lot of people will know, but I actually agree with you on the, on the macro part. It's a, uh, but uh, I like simple because it works and it fixes actual problems. At least uh, that was the case uh, for us. Um, so anyhow, I'll, um, I'll, by the way, another very interesting point, which I think everybody should take note of is your comment on autonomous. It's a word that not a lot of procurement practitioners really know. I think that will be a key word for all of us to understand and work with in the coming years. So thanks a lot for for sharing those uh, things, Corey. Um, if we look at Kearney, um, Kearney has, has also outlined the importance of organizations to, to look beyond just the sweet thought. So this idea that buy one system and that will fix uh, everything, and then look much more at uh, microservices. And Eloise, you even uh, released a book uh, on digital transformation on, on this, uh, this approach. Can you explain what that means? And also for maybe for a, a foundational capability like sourcing? Yeah, so a sourcing is the perfect example to either expose or illuminate why one-stop shopping doesn't work. And, and being that I was, a, a, you know, I've been, I'm older, I watched the entire platform market take shape in the early 2000s and then get all the acquisitions from like 2008 to 2016. And now the uh, uh, push into uh, the, you know, the best of breed again, and sort of this movement into a procurement platform. So it's actually been quite a, quite a wild ride. And so on one hand, I've seen a lot of this before. And on another hand, it's, it's vastly different. What's really interesting is that, or, or perhaps maybe the best way, I'm trying to think of a politically correct way to say this, but where the suites often fell over. Suites were really good at the per, procure to pay and or rec to pay part of the equation. But when we were talking about source to contract, sourcing is where they really did not uh, innovate in the way that they needed to. And because the way we do, we source logistics is vastly different than the way we source tail spend or pencils or office supplies, which is vastly different than our day-to-day, -day, uh, you know, categories, our strategic categories. 
And so I've often argued that as these sort of new entrants have come into the market, that we need at least four sourcing tools, if not five or six. Uh, and especially as we think about these new category specific solutions that are coming into the market. And so what that does is it gives us a lot of optionality. And that's important because sourcing is where we drive the predominant amount of value. Yes, P2P gets us efficiencies and allows us to process. But remember, I can run a single uh, sourcing event and save $100 million. So like the ROI is there. So the, the, I mean, it's beyond there. So the fact that there's a lot of innovation in sourcing is important. Now, I want to just go back to this sort of, uh, sort of moving beyond the suite. So what I really am, are, have been arguing is that we need to move away from a closed loop suite into an, a platform approach where you have this open marketplace of capabilities that plug in. And that's what I'm always looking for. And if, for those that saw or didn't see my post at the end of last year, I thought one of the notable achievements in 2021 was, was Coupa and Ariba launched app stores, which means that they, they too see the same thing and they are basically making it very easy. So if you're running a sourcing event, you can embed this best of breed technology, whether it's insights coming from the market or optimization capabilities or you know, scenario awards and or ESG information. That's the beauty of an interconnected platform. And what I would add to the automation, and I like Corey's point about the automation, I think that's half the equation, but I think the other half is making it easy to use self-service. And when we have these platforms where all of this capability is embedded and it's actually easy to use, it drives adoption and it becomes an equal part automation, but an equal part self-service. Excellent points. Um, Fabian, you and uh, now Eloise talks about these these, uh, this opportunity to sort of inject specialized solutions for, for example, optimization capabilities. And you, you represent one of those. Uh, what, what's your perspective uh, on this with microservices versus suite and, and how they coexist and collaborate and, and even partner up? I think it's a, it's an absolutely amazing development, uh, and especially this SAP App Store is something that that we're now part of as well because it is this my this network fault, right? So that you don't have everything in one place, but that you really go back to this kind of environment that we use in our consumer world on our phone that we have different apps for different problems, right? And everything is very specialized and focused on solving one problem at a time, and. It, it's a very interesting development because yes, there is the opportunity now to have basically a solution for everything. The question for me is then always, how much can you handle? And you know, if we have five tools in sourcing, then we have maybe three for contracting and another two for spend analytics and then another three for P2P. I personally think that that might just overwhelm organizations. And again, it depends probably very much on the maturity and the willingness to deal with that and to really get into it. But one example that I have seen personally uh, as a consultant was where there were two, there were only two tools that solved basically the same problem. And the, the overlap was so strong that both tools didn't deliver on the ROI that was expected because they weren't managed properly. And basically the, the roadmaps diverged a bit that at the end of the day, you know, like uh, you didn't use either of them to their full potential. And I think that's the, that's the downside of this. Whereas the upside to me is again, very, very clear. You don't need to have this one place where you get everything and try to overcomplicate your, your process. Because again, the suites, they're somewhat, are uh, comparable and if that's the case then you might just pick one that is actually most open to 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 integrate with other solutions and i think that's a, that's the a real mindset shift uh, in sap and cooper um that that i believe is is going to be the future for them great thanks corey anything to add to this point 
I, know I just want to emphasize what uh, I just heard about platform to platform, and I think that is uh, really important to get it done right. Um, platform to platform in an environment like uh, maybe think about in a simple terms like uh, iOS with a lot of applications not going to solve the problem because it's not integrating enough to create a holistic picture and a cohesive organizational effort. <laughs> now a lot of words there, but the the, the, uh, the the importance there I think is to think about it like the network of networks. <clears throat> and when we think about network of networks, it's about sharing and participating, in getting services back. And uh, when we think about that within an organization, think, think about supply chain. So uh, the planning and idea generation, the innovation department shares the ideas and drawings and specifications that get molded into actually a, a, a request for a sourcing event and the contract and then the client demands become deliveries. And in circle of you actually complete it by bringing it back into the value stream in either the same form recycled or in different ways to create additional value. And I think technology needs to adapt to that and not create itself like application silos and even in an, in, an, in an SAP environment like an application store may easily become overwhelming for the user. Um, and some feedback there may be that some of the cool technologies we see out there, once implemented, they don't see as much user traction as they would estimate it in the beginning of the process where the excitement about the technology was high and sometimes you know, subscriptions for 100 plus users, the only um, attraction of 10 users was so accessing it continuously um, and use it in, in that process. So <clears throat> when we think about platform to platform network uh, of networks, we need to think about it not only as the outside technologies to work together, but also really looking into the inside collaboration and cohesive films. Cool. And, uh, and what a perfect lead in to sort of begin the discussion uh, on the future. So uh, in my book, I have a, a full chapter, you can say, on the future of, uh, of sourcing technologies, my perspective on, on autonomous negotiation agents, the role of AI, uh, et cetera. What do you guys see as, as some of the most ex exciting developments within uh, digital sourcing and negotiations? Uh, it's for sure an area that are evolving uh, rapidly, um, but, um, but how do you see it, uh, Eloise? Anything on, on trends uh, that, is, that is coming up in the, in, the, in the years to come? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think automation is coming. I'm not as, uh, this is interesting because we're getting a diverse set of opinions here because I actually think automated sourcing is going to be, la it's going to lag a little bit. I think the capability is there, but, and I'm excited for it, but I also think it's going to take a while to really come to, to scale at the level that we all hope and expect it to. And because partially, what are, we, what are we actually trying to achieve? Because what happens if we use sourcing bots and our suppliers use sourcing bots? Well, then we're just going back and forth, but we have the, this sort of you know, price that gets to the right price that we want. Well, that's essentially a marketplace. So do we really need all these bots doing all this stuff versus moving to a marketplace. So I think automation throughout is good to accelerate it, to increase adoption back to Corey's point. Uh, so I think there is a lot to be done, but I also, I, I, I think the, the army of bots that is gonna take over sourcing might be a little overdone because I think what we really need to drive at is, is how can we think about who we are negotiating with and what's the role, like what's the role of the category manager? I have a very unpopular opinion around here at Carney is that I think category managers are going away or at least reducing in size. And even the centers of excellence that we created to help drive sourcing adoption, I think those become irrelevant or, or less necessary as the tools become democratized as the tools become better self-service. And so I'm more interested in the usability and adoption. And like you said at the beginning, the change management than I am about uh, like a, <laughs> the, the army of bots that's gonna take over yeah. our jobs. So it's, it's, maybe, it's maybe more an augmented uh, intelligence yeah. rather than automation that we are talking about. Um, yeah, and actually, it's not nearly as exciting, but it absolutely, I think, is more uh, realistic. 
I, I think it's uh, I think it's hugely exciting. But I also say on on the COE now I've spent the last uh, more than a decade running a COE, so of course I'm I'm a little emotional on that, and I, I definitely see a a role for COEs as well. I agree mm -hmm. that the role will probably change for a center of excellence, and and when you say change management, somebody needs to own that agenda and drive it if you want to see to you know adoption. So I still think there'll be a need and a role for people who can translate the technical capabilities into the procurement function. Um, but, I, but I very much agree with you that we are, will see huge changes in the road, both for category managers, but also for the, for the COEs uh, going forward. Um, well, yeah. And if I could just add, COEs came, and it's relevant to the history here, COEs came about because when you talked about combinatorial optimization coming into the market, that was wildly overwhelming to the vast majority of users. And so back to my point from the first question is, as it becomes, as this, this optimization and scenario uh, you know, modeling becomes much more user friendly, there's less and less need for the center of like the really uber yeah. smart people sitting in the COE. Fabian, can you chip in here as well? Future yeah, trends? I I, I mean, like this is, I love this discussion because obviously uh, I love uh, optimization and I believe that there's a lot of opportunity and the, the point on the bots and automation, I think it, it's, it's quite interesting, right? Being in this industry uh, now, I, I see how much of talk is going on. Whereas when I was a, in a procurement organization, just as a user, you don't have any clue about all of that, right? That's not your day job. You're not really exposed to that. And so unless you work in a COE or are focused on tools, that's usually not your day-to-day -day kind of conversation. And so therefore, I think it's it's quite interesting to see how these conversations happen in parallel with one group not even participating in it or not being aware of it. And another group talking now all about automating everything and every person will basically eventually go away because bots are talking to bots. And I find that quite amazing because I don't believe it. I, I simply don't believe it. And I love the honesty, uh, Eloise, or your transparency on, on that as well. Because I just think when I look at who we're talking to, right, and in general at the majority of organizations, what I see is not people getting too autonomous. They haven't even started walking. So the majority of organizations that we talk to, they do everything in Excel. They send out their tenders still from Outlook. Uh, and even if they have a suite already implemented, they're actually using it as a glorified outbox. I have yet to see the organization that is truly using e-sourcing and e-auctions as a standard way of working. And yet we're talking about automating everything. I know at Mask, you have been doing a great job and you have been pushing quite hard, but, it, but it's just not a reality I see. And to just con yeah. conclude that point, now we're talking about these all of these new companies joining the game, right? And going after the suites. For me, the biggest differentiator is the user interface, the user experience, and how do we get them? We talked about Combine It and yeah. those likes that were requiring centers of excellence because it's just way over the head of people right i mean like the first time i looked at those things my eyes glanced over and i was like uh, okay cool so and that's where we believe there's the major shift that we're bringing it to a consumerized approach where people are like oh yeah okay looks nice want to engage with it cool oh yeah i click a little bit here click a little bit there all right get a result and i think that is a more realistic way to get towards like something like automation or like i like to call it smart automation getting rid of the tasks that bog you down as a strategic uh, category manager like all of the nitty-gritty non-value add stuff that's what we need to get rid of and there's so much opportunity for that without necessarily talking about autonomous sourcing so i think that's the real opportunity in the future and where we will definitely go before we hit autonomous for bot to bot kind of uh, tender management in my opinion i I think a lot of uh, a lot of good points, uh, Fabi. And let me just bring forward one which I think was was particularly interesting, and that is that actually the main competition for for sourcing solutions today, that's still the office suite, as I understand. So it's Outlook and Excel. So you guys, you shouldn't compete with each other. Just get uh, get users to actually use it, uh, and then the, the pie will be bigger. 
So I, I think I mean, that's food for thought for all providers in this space, actually. But, but, but you know, Microsoft has just acquired a player yeah. in our <laughs> I know, industry. I know. <laughs> so therefore, maybe they will just make sure that Excel becomes even easier and better to yeah, use. Yeah. So yeah. <laughs> that's my biggest fear. Yeah. So Corey, uh, Gartner is doing a lot of, a lot of research on, on this as well. So do, do you see any geographical or industry-specific uh, differences? Uh, and also then may, maybe a controversial question here. Uh, how much truth is there also to the to the ROI, uh, or how much is just the sales claim when we talk about these things? When you see it from the analyst uh, point of view. Yeah, uh, I mean maybe just one uh, clarification: of how uh, I look at uh, autonomous procurement. It's it's not something that you see. It's in the background, and there are no bots. It's just a integration between platforms to platform that they basically run on optimization algorithms, right? Like any negotiation that should be sustainable needs to be beneficial mutually. <clears throat> Otherwise you have an opportunistic relationship that will fall apart uh, at, the, at the first uh, exit basically. So when we're thinking about that, like uh, optimization of negotiations is really something that uh, is happening people to people right now very often. Um, and then um, they are supported by technology, by Excel lists, and, and maybe before it was the calculator, they carried with them. Um, <laughs> but uh, eventually, it's really about the value equation for each company that uh, is based on key metrics like on time and in full, at quality, um, you know, over time costing, total cost of ownership approach, and so on, geopolitical diversity, uh, you name it. Um, so when, we, when we're thinking about um, now the usability uh, and how we see a differentiation, we see larger corporations being more interested in the resilience, agility drivers through technology and are at a very vast majority interested to change their business processes towards that. So uh, giving a few numbers there, like almost 80% of large corporations, which means a billion and above revenue are really looking into changing their approach. Um, what we don't see equally is in small and medium-sized enterprises, so a billion and below. And there the ROI questions comes into place and the barrier of implementation, how complex the change management may be or the lack of actual knowledge there to implement it. Um, and I have to put the burden on the vendors too. Um, they like to pride themselves with large corporations as client references. So they don't cater to mid-size and small enterprises necessarily to acquaint to their needs and their implementation models as much either. So there is a natural distance, but also a, um, I would say like a, a lack of trust maybe that the technology really leaps them forward um, as, uh, maybe the amount uh, of RFP or the, the, the quantity of RFPs and the value of the RFPs are not that high for small and medium-sized enterprises, they, they think that the suites will be not driving an ROI, right? So um, what we see there right now is really a, a thought-provoking and changing mindset when we think, we haven't seen it realized yet, so I, I really love the marketplace concept. Um, mm -hmm but also the network of networks. And what that means is like, there is not a contract with a specific technology vendor. There is a participation almost as a member in a ecosystem. And in that ecosystem, you participate through data uh, and you participate through interaction and uh, far-fetched thinking brings it back to tokenization. Now I'm really scratching the edge of things. Yeah. When we think about tokenization being a gift given to participation, you utilize that for certain technology services, may it be analytics, may it be certain data into supply, supply network visibility, may it be into engineering software and so on, right? Which lowers the bar of implementation and costing to any member because it's, it's centralized, but it's actually not, it's distributed network services. Um, <clears throat> and that could really be a game changer for small and medium-sized enterprises to just get on and uh, advance. Think about it in your own consumer profile, right? Who was able to buy a computer 50 years ago, just the largest of largest enterprises? We were running around probably pen and paper for a long time, right? <clears throat> and until we like break the barrier down of costing and also yeah. mass education on the benefits of certain technologies, it takes time. And at some point, 
you know, I think Excel will phase out. <laughs> Maybe never. I don't know, right? So, um, but it was, you know, it's been around for a very long time. So has been blockchain, but it hasn't like get to the mass education. If you ask ten people if they know blockchain, they will say yes. If you ask a follow up question, how does it work? <laughs> then ten out of ten will make something up because they will be too embarrassed to really say they don't know. So, um, and and that's sort of like <clears throat> where is the tipping point, right? Yeah. And um, I think very distinguished approach of large enterprises and uh, they are able to put a COE, a dedicated team, a budget that is effective maybe to trial out in sandbox environment and a small medium enterprise, they basically have said literally, we will continue our traditional priorities until there's a disruption and then we will react to that appropriately. You know, very, <laughs> very, um, very interesting uh, discussion on, on technology and also on sort of the approach and the perception with the different types of, of companies. And it, it actually leads well into sort of the next uh, topic where we'll talk more about this adoption thing, uh, facts versus fiction, and some of the myths that exist about uh, procurement uh, technology. Because often, and you can relate that all the way back, as I said in the, in the intro, that it has kind of a bad name uh, with some people. Uh, auctions, I think, is an excellent uh, example of that. But um, but what's your what's your take uh, on that, uh, Fabian? How do you see that with sort of the perception of, of technology, the myths and, and facts versus fiction? Mm. Uh, yeah, I think Cora actually just uh, played on one of them, like uh, that it, it's costly to implement and that the cost for small organizations are, are too high to actually adopt something. And I, from our perspective, uh, as a software as a service vendor, I, I have to disagree because it, it, it's not like in the past where you had to buy something for a million and spend perception. another- Perception, perception. The perception, the small one is lack of education or also yep. the lack of vendors engaging with that kind of clientele in that level, right? So, uh, maybe some learnings, uh, or you have already improved or implemented other approaches there on your end, right? That would be to yeah. Totally. But if you if you think about it from a perspective of like in the past, you had to buy something for a million and spend two million to actually get it up and running. Um, that's in software as a service, not really the case. I think there's still an element of the, especially the change management coming back to the people uh, component that we touched upon earlier and that we will now talk about in this uh, in this myth section, I guess. But from a technology perspective, uh, like for a lot of these solutions, the, the implementation cost is so different than it used to be just even a couple of years ago. And that shouldn't be a barrier anymore. But now to, to come back to that question of like what adoption, right? Adoption has always been the main struggle. Tools have been there for decades and still we're talking about, well, should we use that or not? Uh, I think it's a problem that people fear something and, and and don't wrap their head around of how do I make technology work for me? Because everybody is selling them, technology solves all your problems, but there's no one size fits all approach. And so people still need to think, how do I apply the technology in my use case to make it work for me? There's a people component. And that's why when Elise said earlier, like uh, some people don't believe that everybody will go away and we don't need category managers. I mean, we need people to be smart about how to apply it. Like if two bots haggle around what's the best price and yeah, well, uh, eventually we will not get anywhere. But it's the people part that I think uh, has the biggest opportunity in the future to really decide where do I apply what. It's a tool and in the toolbox, you use the right tool in the right moment. And that's a decision that I don't think a bot or RPA, which is just a different way of describing that, is ever going to solve. Well, and let me build on that because I think people is the often the, like the digital capabilities and the comfortability with the language of analytics. We talk about analytics ad nauseum and we throw all those buzzwords around, but I think our analytical competency is not where it needs to be. I think it's getting there. And I think that's because again, those of us that are older, when combinatorial optimization came in you know, hit the market and all, we had all these solvers out there. And I know I was, and I'm, I know I'm not alone or I wasn't alone trying to figure out what's, what's an optimizer, what's the solver, what's that, like, what is all this stuff? Whereas 
folks in every five years entering the market have skills 10x, 100x better than those of us that came before us because these the MBA programs in particular and even undergrad programs are putting these concepts into play. And so I think the talent and the analytical competencies are really much more, uh, much more improved. And then there's just general digital literacies and a little back to Fabian and Corey, your points is yes, you have a marketplace of apps. Well, part of this is you have to be able to have that comfort level to you know, uh, you know, choose an app, use it. And if it's not working, send it back and, and, and try and experiment. And these are the, from a, these are the organizational cultures that are not there today. So yes, we have to upskill the people and new employees coming into the workforce are starting to have these capabilities, but we also correspondingly have to create this digital culture, uh, you know, that culture of experimentation, of failure, that those are often used, but I think they apply here. But I think, I, you know, with okay. just maybe a quick comment, like if you look at the recent years, even um, the ownership of technology decisions and implementations have been in a different area in the organization in the CIO, CTO area very often. So very uh, rarely uh, CPO was independent of trying out technologies. Uh, one is like, they will throw you the, 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 the InfoSec uh, cover onto you and say like, oh my God, you know, what are you exposing us? Are you crazy? Um, no, 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 we're gonna do this for you. Uh, but the other thing you hear, and that unfortunately is giving the false message to uh, be, bit more courageous is is the the big news about those those mistakes that have been going around like Lidl and SAP half a billion euro side right if you hear that you're like oh my god right I don't want to be that one in the news uh, and and you you hear the other ones too right so and I think the dynamics have changed like to more agile less disruptive technologies to the existing systems and not everything needs a CIO maybe now I'm hitting myself right but not everything needs a CIO evaluation to get tried out um, and it can be very safe to try it out despite maybe some of yeah the concerns that every company has for themselves because cybersecurity has been a rising issue uh, but we also have seen the preparedness, regardless of you deploy a software or not, is in very many organizations anyway, not that high. I mean, you know, from food processor to I getting stuck on actually little real story on Martha's Vineyard last year when the steamship authority got hacked and we were like, okay, the ship is there. I'm here. We could go. Why do we need technology? We have a captain, right? It's just a mile that way on mainland. So no, right? So you're stuck. Um, and, and I think it will hopefully come into balance, but uh, I just wanted to make, a, I, I actually love that comment, right? And, and I think there's a bit of that, let's bring it down to earth a bit and uh, more practical improvements and, than theoretical catastrophes. That's and excellent. Uh, and that's, it. I just, yeah. that's because that's exactly what we'll do now is that we'll sort of bring it uh, one step further down. It's, it's great discussion and great points. But, uh, and we've talked a lot about sort of the future and these different uh, uh, approaches to it, but, but what does it really mean for individuals and organizations and, and how do you get started? And let's just do a, a quick sort of round the table here. So just a couple of minutes uh, uh, from each of you. If you were in a, in a procurement organization and you want to get started with this, what do you do? And, and Fabian, uh, I'll start with you, but don't say call yeah. me. That, that can't be the answer. <laughs> Call me. Yeah. yeah. You can all say that. No, but, but, but seriously. Um, and, and I think it's a good uh, transition from uh, Eloise's point still. Like with this digital literacy, right? And the, the user adoption. At the end of the day, that's what I would always want to look at. And I think we have come a long way in consumerizing a couple of the applications and making them easier. And especially in optimization, I think that is the key. We cannot leave the people behind just because like the MBA programs get, get, get better and people became uh, more digital uh, natives. We cannot now leave half the, half the people in procurement behind because they might not have had the opportunity to get there. And so therefore I think 
I want to get solutions that are not only for the techies and the nerds. I want solutions that work for everybody. And so if I think about how do I do that, I basically simplify them. I simplify them to the point where they do what is necessary and not everything that is possible. And if I can achieve that, then I think we can get everybody on board and bring everybody with us on this journey and not have them afraid and get sick and uh, scared of new solutions. And so I think when I look at what does the future hold, like uh, that, that's that's my key focus. What solution helps me from a user adoption perspective by just being more intuitive, more helpful. Yeah. Um, and so that, that would be where my focus would definitely be and where I would say, let's, Good input. let's, let's focus on those. So let, let me sum it up. So you say focus on ease of use because that will help you drive adoption if, uh, if that's one advice. All right, Corey. That's my what, simple what? one. <laughs> Super. Corey, same question. Uh, I would say playing like the three monkeys is not going to make you a better company or survive the next few years better than others who try. So go out and try would be my message. And in addition to that, it would be um, try fast, fail fast, and um, try to become a value orchestrator through technologies. Now, another uh, buzzword, what does that mean? It basically means that you need to look beyond just one specific target on your business agenda. Let's say savings, or let's say, uh, you know, from a finance perspective, working capital or something like that. So look at it as what is the true value that we're generating out of our process and how can we become faster and yeah. faster in an environment where data is just becoming vast and almost uncontrollable and dependencies are where you don't even knew where they were. So you need to, increase the literacy of data to become a value orchestrator. So education, 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 and that's on your people. You need to change your processes to be more adaptive to what's out there. Like just piling up more checkboxes in a process without meaning it out, it's not gonna solve the technology problem, right? So the technology coming into a process that is burdened by itself, it's not gonna be a better solution at the end of the day because then the technology may not work. And then last but not least, try out emerging technologies and get educated on them because there is a first mover advantage to those, right? You can influence the way mm. the technology will evolve. You can be the sparring partner of those early uh, uh, incumbents. Um, when you think about innovation trigger, don't always wait for the plateau of productivity to then implement something oh. like SAP and Eagle <laughs> and then pay half a billion dollars and say that was actually the wrong choice. Um, let's revive our old yeah. system. Um, so um, it's actually advisable to create sort of like an environment of sandboxes that are funded with almost like, a, again, it can be a lot of money for a lot of companies, but larger companies, this pocket change, where they have internal composable teams, not necessarily by IT people, a couple of procurement people, yeah. planning people come together and say, hey, we are thinking about this hypothesis that the technology can solve. Can you give us funding? And they will give funding for 50,000 euros or so dollars, whatever it is, the currency. And they go out and try it in the sandbox and then hyperscale it when it's, when it's good. Uh, and it worked for them in their context. So uh, I see some leading companies actually exactly with that approach. So that would be... Some- let me try and sum it. Sentence, yeah, 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 it was. <laughs> so let me sum it up uh, the way I understood it that the two cents and practical advice is just do it, move fast, and fail fast. Uh, if I was to sum it up, good input. And, and Eloise, uh, uh, you as well, where would you get I would, started? I would start at the leadership level. And I think probably the biggest impediment is that leaders are not doing all the things Corey just said. And I spent a lot of my time bridging that gap with CPOs and trying to get them comfortable with the change. That's why I write about, is this real? And I'm always asking that question because that's the question I'm always getting asked and I'm always researching that question. And so it is real and the truly spectacular leaders understand this and they are they are pushing the boundaries and they look at, there's been a couple of Q and A's coming by about ROI and they measure ROI in three to six weeks, not 
18 months or three years or five years, three to six weeks. And if you're not operating at that cadence, using all the things again, Corey just said, then you're not doing it right. And you're just making the same mistakes of the past. And similarly, that, that strong leadership, strong leaders are seeking to change the agenda. I saw a Q&A about moving beyond cost, which is true, it's total value and, and not total cost. And in that is driving ESG, driving innovation, driving resiliency and uh, corporate responsibility. All of that can be driven through procurement because we actually are an operational function and so we can move the needle. And so leaders, good leaders understand that and say, that's my objective. I don't care how we do it. Let's get some tools in here that get that, that will do that. And then just a quick thing, quick leaders will, good leaders will understand that a lot of these initiatives fail at the middle manager level. And because you have younger generations coming in, they're excited, they are digitally enabled, and you have leaders that set these objectives, but the middle managers, which are of at least my generation, are like, eh, you know, I don't really, I don't, I, I, I'm just happy with Excel and Outlook. So I think that it, your job as a leader is to break that dynamic and, and, and or at least identify it and then fix it. Super. Really interesting. And, and again, yeah, start with the leadership. And, and that, I guess, relates back also to the change management piece. Um, we'll now move into the uh, Q&A uh, sec section. And, and we've received a lot of good questions here. And I'll see how many we can cover. Um, there's one here for Corey. Uh, so what should be the return on investment of a procurement software tool? Uh, that should be easy. So that's a range, I guess. Positive. Um, yeah. <laughs> I mean, no, it can be more than you pay, and let's say actually more than you invested. Uh, but yeah. it can be also just positive in the way it influences the culture and the and 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 the way of work, right? Not everything needs to be in dollars. Some of it actually can be an ease of work, and then freeing up time that will come back much later in value that's generated by people not doing clerical work. Um, and that doesn't mean you get rid of the people. You actually use their natural skills of relationship yeah. building and human human influence and, and, so, and creativity. So let, let me challenge you a bit with a quick follow up. So there's not a range where you would say it should be above fifteen, or above twenty percent, or. I mean, quite honestly, the hundred thousand dollar software implementation can drive a one hundred million dollar saving if you run a billion dollar project through. So, at the yeah. end of the day, um, if I were to create a software company, sometimes I would think, "Hey, I want to just run it for free and partake parts of your savings that you generate." Right? That could be an interesting mm -hmm. business model because that lowers the barrier and really puts them on the hook. Now, the problem is, what is the baseline and uh, yada yada yada. But even like consulting companies companies do that nowadays because um, they see that the trust relationship from the get-go is almost an advance of trust, right? Because yeah. I trust myself to give you value back. So you, you should entrust parts of the value back to me. And if I fail, then it's on me, right? And the same yeah. way I think technology can yeah. think. About. So at the end of the day, will, does, is there... I will ask you back, do you feel like there is a technology that hasn't proven an ROI? That has a proven ROI? Has not given you an ROI. Besides the Roomba, which is really like I have and I get aggravated every night about it's it because it gets stuck. Yeah. I, I think it's hard. It. Yeah, it's, it's a fair point and a fair challenge, actually. And I, and I would say uh, the, the short answer is yes, because I've seen plenty of examples of that. And, uh, but I would, I would then say it has nothing to do with the technology. It has to do with the people developing the case and doing the implementation. And, so, and think about like that failure maybe leading to an improvement of the technology towards an adoption that is better. So but I, I also... Yeah. And I think just to add to it, another important point is that I've seen so many examples where we as practitioners, we would develop a business case, actually spend a long time on it, get the budget approval, and then we'll get rid of the business case and never look at the ROI again. And that's not best practice. I think you systematically need to track uh, use of the business case to ensure you realize the value potential. Uh, that's, uh, I think, is essential. What return means, right? What does return mean? Beginning of yeah. the Right. If return really means it has to be in the PNL at that line and hit that account, yeah. 
<laughs> then you work towards that, but you are limiting yourself in understanding what technology value can bring for you, uh, even in the intangibles, right? It, it has to be much broader than dollar uh, value, of course. There, there are many soft uh, benefits as well. Sorry for putting you on the spot. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's perfectly fine. Um, a question for Eloise. Uh, do you see a collaborative mindset with sourcing tools to be part of the ecosystem? Or does everyone want to further grow their capabilities and try to avoid partnerships? I'm not sure I totally understand the question, <laughs> but I will take a but, crack uh, but, at it. But I, and neither do I. So let's let's focus on collaboration and sourcing tools and how, how maybe a, a little bit of a reflection on that, because there is, and I guess it's back to the myth that a sourcing tool, that's competition, and it's just about squeezing margins. So do you see an opportunity for collaborating through technology or sourcing technology? Well, I think that's where it becomes the power of sourcing becomes it's it, that real, it becomes realized. And what has been the great thing about combinatorial optimization is that you don't lock your bid packages aren't this big monolithic thing. You can break them up into various capabilities and various options and the suppliers can give, can collaborate with you to find the optimal scenario for you. And that, that has been the biggest breakthrough and why this has remains sort of one of the greatest innovations in sourcing uh, for sure, if not procurement. Yeah. And, and that ability to get precision in that, and we're now seeing that applied to other categories that have been traditionally harder to do like services, and so I think taken together, the, those are the, the real true breakthroughs. And, and what that does is it gets you better collaboration with your supplier, which is really, and, and really tier one, tier two suppliers. And okay. that's what we're driving at. And that's what we're always trying to get better supplier relationships because contextually that's what, it, this is not about negotiating a particular yeah. contract. It's about building that relationship. Yeah. It's, it's an excellent I, point. I I just that? Really, really quickly, because Combined had actually spent a lot of effort in branding their solution as collaborative uh, sourcing. Yeah. And uh, so that could be free advice for you, uh, Fabian, and then chip in here. Yeah. Taken, but I, I believe that uh, this network idea for me goes even further. We, for example, just have announced a partnership with, uh, with Tealbook as a data partner, right? And for me, like what I preach is holistic sourcing and holistic sourcing is exactly what you just talked about, like to not look at one dimension, but bring in all of the different angles that are important. So Cora talked about risk earlier, there's ESG, there's supply diversity, there's obviously cost, there's 15 other dimensions that are usually important in a sourcing decision that in today's world are often just either done at the beginning and then never looked at again, or they live in isolation. And I believe that sourcing tools have the opportunity to be that connector, to actually bring those information together at the moment where you create value. And that is usually in the sourcing process. And so I believe um, that the sourcing definitely has the opportunity to deliver a lot of value by ecos through ecosystems and through partnering. So therefore I, I fully believe in partnerships. Um, is it possible with everybody all of the time on every single thing? Probably not. That's probably unrealistic. But from a mindset perspective, I believe uh, there's a lot of players that are open to taking on this idea and uh, yeah, just working together. That's uh, the value of partners, right? I yeah. just want to add one comment there quickly because I believe in the context of what we're living through in the last couple of years, it's really important that we look at technology also as an equity provider not just equality, equity provider. What that means is when we think about diverse vendors, small suppliers, medium-sized suppliers, they cannot go and, you know, go onto a huge OEM's website and build a profile and then be selected maybe for something they're really good at. Before an SQE from Volkswagen appears on their door to evaluate their manufacturing process, they need to be seen. And the under the radar innovations are so vastly important for companies to advance that um, with 
without technology, it's almost impossible to discover them, right? Or to process them through acquisition processes that are generally very rigid and very uh, uh, complicated or specific to a company. Yeah. So the technology disruption there, I hope, and I see that, is lowering that bar um, and hopefully opens the door for many more uh, diverse and innovations that come through. And you see, and I don't know if it's a good thing or not, and sometimes I think it's a good thing because I see small pieces in, in you know, D parts, uh, C parts and, and, and tailspin bringing down large corporations because they haven't been managed. And why? Because they don't have the technology to manage that can facilitate the relationship building because they are focused on A and B parts mainly. And so C and D parts come from small vendors often, you know, um, that that's I think it's a, it's a, it's yeah. a, it's a technology opportunity to to drive actually equity in good. the whole supply yeah. network and ecosystem. So that's a good point to end on, uh, and I'm sure we could continue the discussion uh, for hours, but uh, but unfortunately we are we are out of time as expected. We we didn't manage to cover uh, all the questions, but. I want to thank uh, the panel and everybody who called in for their uh, attendance today. Uh, I think we are all uh, on LinkedIn, so we should be accessible. If there are any sort of burning questions that you didn't get answered, uh, please reach out. I've, I know we are all very passionate about these things, so we don't mind uh, the dialogue. Um, but with that, I just want to say uh, thank you and wish you all a good uh, day and a good uh, week ahead. Uh, take care, everyone, and stay safe. Bye. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye, everyone. Bye.